I'm Deborah Lou Harder. I'm the radio host of the Metropolitan Opera, and I'm so honored and pleased to be hosting today's panel for AAPI Month 2023. We have such a stellar group of musicians with us today. We'll start with Ying Fong, soprano, Kensha Watanabe, conductor, Nancy Wu, associate concertmaster, and Caitlin Trunterell, who's a pianist and assistant conductor here at the Met. So I thought it'd be fun for us all to introduce ourselves by talking about um, where we were born, where you grew up, and if you're Asian American, where your family comes from in Asia and who in the family came over to the States. Ying, do you want to start? I'll start. So my name is Ying, and I am from China. My hometown is Ningbo. It's a beautiful city on the coast uh, of southeastern China. And uh, yeah, I came here uh, in 2010 to study at Juilliard School, and then later was in the Lindemann program at the Met, and then later, of course, um, started to perform at the Met. So that's it. That's great. Me. Great, Kensho. Hi, Kensho Watanabe. I was born in Yokohama, Japan, and I moved to the States when I was five years old, um, and kind of did all of my schooling here and thought I was going to be a doctor and I've found myself here at the Metropolitan Opera somehow. So it's <laughs> great to be here. Great. Hi, I'm Nancy Wu. I was born in New Brunswick, New Jersey, but my parents are from China. In fact, my father's family is from Ningbo, but wow. they were both born in Shanghai and came to the United States in 1949. Great. I'm Caitlin Terrell and I was born in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, my mother emigrated from Vietnam and um, came to the United States, met my father, and had me. Um, I went to Eastman for my undergrad and then Juilliard, joined the Lindemann program, and joined the music staff in 2021. Thank you, and I was born in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, my parents met in Vermont. They were probably the only two Koreans in the state of Vermont when they met. <laughs> Uh, my dad is from Seoul, South Korea, and my, my mom from Busan, and she had come over on her own, winning a scholarship um, to go to women's college, which I, apparently it was very unusual for women of that day to come over um, by themselves. So I ended up here at the Met after a long career in medicine, and then teaching piano for many years, and um, getting on the air, talking about classical music, and finally here at the Metropolitan Opera. So we've all had very interesting journeys, I think. Now, I mentioned family because for an Asian person, traditionally family and your responsibility to your family is very important to the culture. For each one of you, does that ring true? And if so, was there a person in your family who influenced your decision to become a musician? Caitlin? 100%. So my mother, when she was a child in Vietnam, she studied guitar and singing and piano and also played the zither. Um, and because of the war, her entire life was disrupted. Um, she emigrated when she was 17, always had this intense love of music. And her father was a senator in the Vietnamese parliament. So when Vietnam was reunified, he was um, you know, taken by the Viet Cong, et cetera, died in prison. Oh. But he always told her, someday you're going to be super rich and you're going to hear music in your house, live music in your house. Um, but piano was not her idea. It was my idea. Um, I was always drawn to the keyboard. It was one of my earliest memories ever. And she's just been my number one fan. I'm kind of emotional to talk about this because later I'll play a lullaby that she sang for me. And um, yeah, absolutely couldn't do it without her. Oh, that's wonderful. Nancy? So my mother, uh, as a young woman working here in New York as a textile designer, attended the old Met and used to go standing room there and heard many performances. She, was, she has a very deep love of classical music. So when my brother and I were young, we were in Los Angeles. She, like many Asian parents, thought we should learn some kind of music. So we started with violin and uh, here I am. I grew up in LA and she supported me, drove me to all my youth orchestra and chamber music. Yeah. You know, coachings, and so she likewise was a huge influence for for my career. That's beautiful. How about you, Kensho? Well, um, I started the violin at the age of two in Japan, and the reason why was because I I think I had an interest for it, but there's a long kind of family history where my mother's father wanted to play the violin, but for 
certain circumstances couldn't. And so when I was born, he wanted a grandson that played the violin. So that's kind of how I started. And when Nancy was just talking about all the driving that uh, my, my parents also drove constantly because we were living in Connecticut and commuting to New York City actually for violin lessons almost two or three times a week. And so uh, I owe very much to my parents my musical upbringing. I think they were doing it not really aware that I was going to become a musician for life, but it was more that they felt the lessons learned and learning an instrument and dedicating yourself to a craft would serve me well in whatever I decided to do. And so I owe a lot of that to the dedication that my parents had. How about you, Ying? Yeah, it's very similar to Kencho's story. My parents were just incredibly uh, supportive, and there were always music playing in the household. And when I was a kid, it was just a very natural thing for me to pick up the tunes that I heard, and they noticed that. And they decided to cultivate that, and they asked if I want to have you know, piano lessons and later singing lessons, and that's how it all started. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Now, for me, um, growing up in Vermont and Ohio, which is where I spent most of my childhood, it was my father. He had a beautiful tenor voice, but he was a doctor. But he would come home every day after work and want to hear what I had learned on the piano. And he would just sit there. He would never criticize. He would just listen to me play my, my little elementary piano pieces. And just, I think, having his approval um, and support in his quiet way was really very important to me. Now, classical music is, of course, a Western tradition, and most of the players are, throughout its history, white. Were there any Asian role models for you, any Asian musicians as role models when you were growing up or training early? Kensho, you're nodding. Well, it's so interesting to me because I think I come from an angle of not ever really thinking this was going to be something that I would take in a path. So, of course, um, you know, musicians that were very active during the time that I was growing up, you know, the Midoris and the Sarah Changs and Seiji Ozawa, those are people that were very much in my consciousness, but uh, it's almost like they weren't really role models because I was so convinced that I was going to do something else with my life that uh, retrospectively now, I think uh, they, those were my role models. Do you think it was important for you to have that sort of, even in your peripheral vision, that there were Asians at the very top? For sure. I mean, if you think about Asian conductors too. If I look back now, I'm wondering if I w if that was my dream at the age of five or six when I was playing the violin, who was I looking towards? Especially growing up in this country, I think it was probably just Seiji Ozawa. That's about it. So um, it's interesting to think about the visibility of Asian Americans, especially like you say at the top tier. Uh, and I hope that um, you know I can kind of serve that at some point in my life. I'm sure you will, Nancy. Thinking back, especially in, at that point in Los Angeles during the 60s and 70s, there were no Asian uh, role models for me. And even later, I studied, I, I did my undergraduate in, at Stanford University in California, and then I went to Vienna, Austria after for five years. And likewise, all my role models were <laughs> Europeans, Russians, uh, you know, it was... It, None, no, none, none at all. So it's very interesting to think back. Mm -hmm. That didn't hinder you in any way, it sounds like, not having an Asian role model for yourself. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> How about you, Caitlin? Um, I guess that's also hard to say. I mean, growing up, I listened to what recordings were available, and I think Yuja Wang became famous like much later. Um, I think what really drove me was just my family as my support system and the loving reminder from my family, you know what we've done for you to get here. <laughs> we all know what that sounds like and what oh, that that, where that comes from. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and again, it was, it was, you know, a lot of it was my mother because she had that musical ear and from love she would always say something to me while I was practicing, don't you think that needs a little bit of feeling and then we'd talk about it you know what I mean but what I really appreciated was she never asked for perfection from me she just said it's fun when you're good at it so if you want to do this do it you know what I mean so a lot of it came internally and I didn't really I didn't really have a lot of external role models and also I just felt that that was more than enough 
for me personally. Mm, that's so beautiful. I want to meet your mother because she has everyone should. <laughs> She's very, very funny. Oh, I hope she comes <laughs> yeah. to the Met and we have a chance to meet. What about you, Ying? Did you have any Asian role models, opera singers as role models? Yes, for sure. I, I remember collecting Sumi Jo's albums when I was a student and I just loved, you know, listening to her singing and the beautiful programming of each, you know, CDs. And also, of course, Hee Kyung Hong, mm -hmm. who is a great uh, artist, uh, in my opinion. And I remember um, watching her um, interpretation of Zelina at the Met when they did it um, with, with uh, Brind and everybody. It was just so inspiring. So for me, yes. Fantastic. That's so good to know. Well. You know, to make it in classical music, you have to have so much discipline and raw talent, of course, and hard work, but you also have opportunity. So for each one of you, what was a pivotal opportunity that led to your professional success? Was there one moment that you can point to that you remember where, oh, this came my way and, and that really without that moment, I wouldn't be here? Nancy? There's so many little moments. There's so oh, many. Oh, Caitlin, go ahead. Oh, I, I mean, um, what helped me make the detour from solo piano to uh, playing for opera singers, so I went to Eastman, and my professor, Nalita True, her studio was next door to Robert Swenson, who is a voice teacher at Eastman now, and he always saw me signing up to practice all hours of the day. And he said, you know, you, you're playing a lot of loud stuff. You should probably play for singers sometime. And then I did, and I found it a lot of fun. I found it a lot of fun. There was someone saying words and breathing, and for me, it just clicked, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, Professor Swenson was very much somebody who said, you know, you could take this seriously if you wanted to, so. I would say that's so it for me. So, so that was another mentor for you besides yeah, your sure. besides your mom. For yeah. sure, for sure. Yes. Yeah. How about you, Nancy? If there wasn't one pivotal moment, what sort of important moments led you to this path? Um, I would say my studies in Vienna were really important. Uh, having grown up in California, I think I was looking for a different uh, a different environment, and Vienna kind of suited me very well. And I. Again, it's kind of interesting to think of role models because for me, in a way, I felt so at home because I always loved Mozart and Beethoven and the kind of German repertoire. It really somehow uh, you know, spoke to me very personally. So my, my time there, and I went to the opera a lot, and I, I loved it. And my, my professor there was uh, one of the concertmasters of the... Vienna State Opera and Vienna Philharmonic. So um, I think that, you know, certainly I got to see how an opera company, an opera orchestra could be a really fantastic thing. In the United States, the Met is really the only full-time uh, or opera orchestra. So it wasn't really on my mind to play in an opera orchestra here, but I had a really good friend who was a member of the Met and she Desiree Elsevier, and she was pivotal because she said, it's a great orchestra, you should audition. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, that, those two things, I would say, really probably put me here. That's fantastic. Vienna and Desiree. <laughs> <laughs> Kencha, what, what about you? Yeah, two, I think two pivotal moments come to mind. One was going for a summer after taking the MCATs and really thinking of being a doctor. I went to the Pierre Monteau School up in Hancock, Maine to study with Michael Jimbo, who just recently passed away. Um, but he was the first one that really convinced me, or at least got me to convince myself, let's say, that I could maybe have a chance at doing music for my life. Um, and then what really kind of confirmed, or I think the reason why I'm here perhaps is uh, being able to step in for uh, Yannick in Philadelphia. I think maybe you were even there in Philadelphia when this happened, where I had five hours notice to jump in because Yannick wasn't feeling well. And Yannick is really by far my most important kind of musical person in my life, and having studied with him and working with him in Philly and now here, um, there's, there's, it's very special to be here, you know, supporting him and also uh, working with him on these great operas as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Ying? Um, yes, I think the first moment was when I was accepted to Juilliard School, where I started, I think, very system training of 
being an opera singer. And that program was really wonderful, you know, um, because I remember my first complete role was done there and opera production was done there. And um, my first Susanna was there. Um, and I also had wonderful connections with, um, you know, coaches and teachers and uh, supporters, you know, since then. And then later, of course, Lindemann program. That's when I start to really go into the business and see how it actually works and how is, you know, a massive production being done, how is it's being rehearsed, and to watch the greatest artists, you know, of nowadays work together. And it's really inspiring. And I still remember as a student, I went uh, to see that time when the last new production of Don Giovanni at the Met, and it was Peter singing it. Mm -hmm. So now it comes to a full circle that we're performing together and he's still singing Don Giovanni Incredible. in a new production at the Met. So, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Now I have a little bit of a harder question for you. I was wondering if any of you has encountered any roadblocks, whether internal or external, because of your race in this career. I don't, I can't think of one. And for me, it's really, I mean, also it's from the upbringing. Um, I refuse to put myself in a, in a place where I can blame externally, meaning it's because of my race. I would always think in a way that, what can I do to be better? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if I'm much better, the choice will be very obvious. It's gonna be me. So <laughs> that's how I think. And I have to say, I've been very lucky. Um, both environments at Juilliard and the Met, it's just so supportive and, you know, s supportive of multiculture. And I just never felt like I'm, I'm an outsider. I feel like I, I'm just gr growing and learning and absorbing the whole time. That's great. Kensho? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's incredibly admirable, <laughs> Ying, <laughs> that you can think this way. And I think we all, I think, think that way in certain ways. Um, I have incurred, you know, a few kind of microaggressions that I think I've kind of experienced that I don't really hold on to. But uh, when I was starting out conducting some of my earlier teach, one of my earlier teachers said, oh, well, Asians aren't very expressive, so you're going to have to work on that, uh, your facial expressions when you're conducting, because it's very important that you emote on the podium. And I find myself to be quite an expressive person already, so to, to be kind of reminded of that or told that at the very outset of my education as a conductor was not necessarily a roadblock, but certainly something that I wasn't expecting to experience. Sounds hurtful. I think, yeah, in that in that moment, but I think we all learn to sometimes just brush that off very much, and so when I'm recounting the story, yes, it does sound hurtful, but I think we've learned also to let go of those things pretty quickly. Caitlin, what about yeah, you? Yeah, uh, regarding microaggressions, absolutely. I think a lot of the times I think that it doesn't bother me, and then I realize I'm still remembering it a few weeks later. You know, you just kind of get used to it that when you're off your game, someone says, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I'm, well, I'm not obsessed with being perfect. Why do you think that I'm trying to be perfect? But actually, what I want to do is flip that on its head and think about how my heritage has kind of made this profession easier for me. Um, I don't know what it's like in a lot of other Asian languages, but in Vietnamese, for example, the pronoun for I changes depending on who you're talking to. And the pronoun that you use for you also depends on who you're talking to. So there's this sense of your fluid role in the community and this sense of your mutable place when you interact with other people. And so in something like being an assistant conductor, a music staff, pianist, when you're working with other people all of the time, subconsciously, I am so aware, that sounds like an oxymoron, but I am aware in my subconscious of what my role is in my interactions with other people and how can I elevate the room or what can I, what is in me that I can bring to something else. And um, that I can, I can see that energy coming from my family, absolutely. That's beautiful. What about you, Nancy? Did you ever encounter any roadblocks, internal or external, because of your race in this profession? Um, there was one very uh, significant one, which, <laughs> which is when I was in Vienna, um, and I loved living there. It was 
during the time when the Vienna Philharmonic not only did not audition women, but as a so-called foreigner, I was uh, also told that I would not even be able to audition for the Vienna Symphony Orchestra, that my best bet would be the radio orchestra. <laughs> so, <laughs> because um, you were a so, foreigner. So, you know, that was, I, and which actually prompted me to think about coming back to the United States. And so I uh, came back here with, uh, you know, good results. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to follow up on that quickly because when you were hired by the Met Orchestra in 1988, I believe, you were the first full-time Asian musician to join the orchestra. You were a trailblazer. Did you feel that at the time? I didn't really feel it at the time. I think maybe partially because the Met's, uh, the Met Orchestra's process is completely blind. So I, you're, the whole, from start to finish, it's behind a screen. So that, you know, which of course, again, coming from Vienna was just like the complete opposite. But I think maybe because of that, I knew I wasn't hired because of my, you know, race or anything. Um, I don't think I really felt like a trailblazer necessarily, but I was just part of the orchestra. And, um, you know, I, I, I do feel like music is so universal, like how... I respond to music or any of us, it's really, it's, again, it's such a personal thing. Mm -hmm. And I, not, you know, I think I can uh, uh, respond to it as similarly as somebody with, you know, a different background. It's just, um, so in a way, I guess I didn't feel like it, but then now looking back, I guess, you know, I was. But, you know, I think it's also the, um, I've, I counted, you know, I was the first, I was the only one of maybe 95, members, and uh, now we have so many more. It's really changed, but I think partially because of, uh, you know, just demographics. Hmm. So. Well, Kingsley Wood, the orchestra manager, said that full, a full 20% of the Met Orchestra full-timers are of Asian heritage, which is pretty extraordinary. I mean, why do you think that is? Is it because it's a blind audition process? It's because it's blind, and I actually went through and looked at the different sections, and it's really interesting. Um, most of the Asians are in the violin sections. <laughs> First and second. <laughs> you are a trailblazer. <laughs> <clears throat> and why that is, I can't exactly explain, but definitely we've, there are, you know, um, for whatever reason, I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of families do encourage their kids to play violin, a lot of Asian families, maybe less uh, double bass <laughs> for whatever <laughs> reason. And certainly not, we don't have any wind players. And uh, again, so we have, I think, 12 out of 17 first violinists are Asian. That's incredible. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Wow. Well, now, following up on facts, when we look at the stage of the Met and the podium, we have a completely different story. So, Ying, of almost 90 sopranos on the, on the roster this season, you are uh, one of only four Asian sopranos. Four I'm lucky. Of <laughs> <laughs> four out of almost 90. And Kencho, out of conductors, you're, you're one out of 22. So you are the only Asian conductor at the Met this season. It seems like there's more work that needs to be done. Thinking about that, what do each of you think the Met can and should do to improve equity on the stage and on the podium. Any ideas? Uh, I mean, from my Your perspe dream, perspective, I mean, really, mm -hmm. like, um, I think Matt has been doing a great job um, because I know many Lindemann young artists are from, you know, Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I know at least one, two, three, four, five um, Chinese um, or Chinese uh, or, or re origin mm -hmm. artists that were in the Lindemann program. So, um, and they are all, they all have been singing on the mat stage and, um, you know, have been developing wonderfully with their careers so far. And yeah, from that's from my perspective. So you think it's, it's doing as much as it can Okay, okay, good. Kencha, what do you think? 
Well, when we're at the the very top level of uh, music making, uh, I think you have to start much, much earlier in terms of developing the talent or making the awareness of younger artists. And so, um, you know, when you say 22 conductors, that's not a lot anyway to start. So um, I think there are hundreds of hundreds, maybe thousands of young conductors out there that would dream of being here at some point in their lives. And I think just maybe if there is more support or awareness for them so that there is more encouragement that this is a place for them, it would be, um, I think, would be helpful. How could and that be done? How could that be accomplished? Well, I think, you know, we talk about representation in this way and we look, we look at the numbers, but I think it's also important to look at the numbers of um, the board composition and also the administration of musical organizations because I think that's where we're actually lacking in terms of Asian American representation. Um, and I think that if we want to, you know, really explore this in a thorough way, then we also need to look at the, the, the n perhaps the most Im more administrative and also um, board support side of things to in make that more inclusive for um, people that are of Asian heritage. So at the, at the leadership level, we need more representation. And Nancy, you are on the board. How did that come about? Um, with our last um, negotiation, it was agreed that there would be board representation from the three union groups, uh, the stagehands, the chorus, or AGMA, and uh, 802, so I was, I was, uh, it was suggested that I be the board representative from the orchestra. I would also add that I think both Ying and Kensho are trailblazers, and their visibility actually I think is really important and has, um, I mean, personally I would say having seen Ying's career <laughs> from the beginning, I feel like she's been such a great role, role model. And because I would say, I think there is a little, there's some stereotypes about what, you know, about our looks on stage or again, like what Ken Sho mentioned about what he can show as a conductor. And I think again, having people like Ken Sho, or, and I think that can be, in, you know, there, there can be more hiring, possibly, especially with conductors and singers. And um, I think that could be an uh, important effort on the Mets' part. Beautiful. We have one minute left. I would love for each of you to give one word of advice to a young musician who's of Asian heritage who wants to live in this world of opera. One word of advice. Nancy, you look like you have something ready. Just Play from your heart. <laughs> Caitlin? Doesn't get much better than that, I guess, yeah. Um, stay honest to yourself and don't worry about how it looks. Yeah. Excellent. Kensho? Very much in the same vein, I think that I discover myself through music, and so um, part of what we do is also really revealing ourselves, and I think we shouldn't hide um, who we are in our heritage. I think it's all part of um, what we bring to the table as musicians and artists, so, yeah. Thank you, Ying. And be patient and go chase your dream. Oh, it's great. And now we have the dreamy experience of hearing you sing with Caitlin playing, and Caitlin will also play a solo piece. So thank you, all of you, for your wonderful insight and for this conversation. It was just, it was just great to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
So Lomme is a lullaby that my mother used to sing to me all the time. It was something that her mom sang to her growing up. And before I play the piano version, I think it would be helpful to have some context of the lyrics. So I'll read them for you now in Vietnamese. Lòng mẹ bao la như biển Thái Bình dạt dào Tình mẹ tha thiết như dòng suối hiền ngọt ngào Lời mẹ êm ái như đồng lúa chiều dì dào Tiếng du bên thềm trang tà soi bóng mẹ yêu. Lòng mẹ thương con như vầng trăng tròn mùa thu. Tình mẹ yêu mến như làn gió đùa mặt hồ. Lời du man mắc em như sáo diều giận giờ. Nắng mưa sớm chiều vui cùng tiếng hát trẻ thơ. Thương con thao thức bao đêm trường. Con đã yên giấc, mẹ hiền vui sướng biết bao. Thương con khuya sớm bao tháng ngày, lạn lội gieo neo nuôi con tới ngày lớn khôn. Dù cho mưa gió không quản thân gầy, mẹ hiền. Một sương hai nắng cho bạc mấy đầu buồn phiền. Ngày đêm sớm tối vui cùng con nhỏ một niềm. Tiếng du êm đềm mẹ hiền năm tháng trên miên. Thank you. 